right? So who am I? Uh, this is me. Um, uh, I know that I no longer look anywhere close to what this is. So I've uh, put on weight, uh, lost hair, and most importantly, I no longer smile. Uh, you never know what ICS and cybersecurity can do to you. Uh, I had no intent of including this slide um, until um, in a couple of other conferences, I've had people uh, walk up to me and ask, uh, or rather tell, that they thought Schneider Electric was in the business of uh, manufacturing uh, elevators um, and escalators. Um, and then I had to remind them that it was uh, Schindler and not Schneider. And then uh, one other person in the US, he said that um, uh, on, on the morning that we met, he said, I saw a truck saying Schneider, so are you into logistics? So I had to tell him that it was uh, Schneider National, which is a logistics company, and got nothing to do with Schneider. Um, of course, we are a French company with a German sounding name, but that's about it. Uh, so the main intent of my presentation is to highlight the fact uh, or the importance of trade controls for um, companies, especially in the ICS world, uh, small and medium uh, sized in, uh, enterprises, and of course, uh, for other companies such as like suppliers, vendors, and things like that. So uh, I just I'll breeze through IoT and IIoT. So uh, we have seen numbers, uh, different numbers from multiple uh, sources uh, from Gartner, from Cisco, conducting their own uh, surveys. And here, uh, Gartner says that 8.4 billion connected things uh, will be in use in 2017, so which is an increase of 30% from the previous year. Um, the other important point is that there are, they say or they forecast that 20 billion connected things will be in use by 2020, so three years from now. And another important point here is that greater China North America and Western Europe constitute for two-thirds of the installed base uh, this year. So anything and everything is getting connected to the internet these days. Uh, refrigerators, smart TVs, like who doesn't have a smart TV these days? And even though I do not know as to why we need a smart refrigerator, uh, hopefully someone needs it. And providing ubiquitous connectivity. So uh, as far as IIoT is concerned, so we are mainly into the, uh, the industrial. We are talking about the industrial realm here, right? So manufacturing, critical manufacturing, uh, utilities, power grids, uh, water, wastewater, uh, military complexes, data centers, uh, healthcare, things like that. Um, so what we see here is a mix of the traditional IT companies, such as Cisco, IBM, Accenture, and the traditional OT companies, such as uh, Schneider, Honeywell, Johnson Controls. So everyone is jumping on the IIoT bandwagon. So I was looking for a definition for IIoT, and um, so Industrial Internet Consortium last September published a document called the Industrial Internet Security Framework, in which they define IIoT as a system that connects and integrates industrial control systems with enterprise systems and that, that enables uh, significant advances in optimizing decision making. So what we see here is that the traditional industrial control systems, which were isolated and not connected to the internet, are being connected extensively. So we can probably classify the IIoT devices into three types, uh, low, medium, and high sophistication devices. So the low sophistication devices are the ones that have minimal to no HMI, and which are kind of binary in nature. So it's either an on or off, yes or no, um, sensors, things like that. They are uh, actually deep down the line uh, behind multiple layers, and there's like no direct communication to the internet. And then we have the medium sophistication devices, um, which uh, along with the things that I said for the low sophistication devices also let you change parameters. Um, so for example, data aggregators, um, and devices which, uh, have, which sound an alarm if something goes beyond a certain threshold. And these devices, may have only a couple of layers of separation from the internet. Uh, the important device that we are concerned about here are the high sophistication devices, um, the ones that let you control and configure. So here we are talking about like smart meters, uh, relays, trip units, breakers. Um, like for example, smart meters these days allows you to send emails, push data to the cloud, uh, among multiple of other things. 
And these devices um, use only our only one or two layers uh, of separated from the internet, and they tend to use um, encryption or cryptography in one form or the other. So earlier we saw a prediction for IoT from uh, Gartner, and so someone uh, took the pain of conducting a survey for IIoT as well, and this is what they found out. So in about five years from now, uh, so the IIoT market is expected to reach a uh, 150 billion US dollars. Uh, an ever-increasing attack surface, of course. Uh, hackers like them. So what has this got to do with uh, trade controls? So, um, so originally, trade controls is, is actually nothing but uh, export-import licenses for uh, items which was primarily used for military purposes. Um, so over time, the scope has expanded, and now they are into commercial products as well. So uh, the main focus of this talk would be on products which use cryptographic algorithms that enable encryption functionality in a product. So why is it important that we look at these things over here? Um, I'll get back to this slide, uh, but so why do we care? Um, because of this, so Wind River, for example, was fined uh, $750,000 for exporting uh, to these countries without proper licenses, and uh, that is after the fact that they self-reported this issue. Um, so the fine could have been much larger. And uh, so previously, as I put here, uh, self-reporting resulted in a warning only, and now uh, looks like fines are the new norm. So blocked sales, uh, so take a direct hit on the revenue, uh, potential liability, so people can sue you uh, no matter what. And uh, so the opportunity for new or recurring business might be difficult. So probably um, so countries can blacklist you on certain products. Uh, it's possible. Um, insecure product. So uh, sometimes, uh, and I'll probably uh, talk about this later, this can result in actually taking a step backwards. So wherein we are going back uh, security-wise uh, and pro producing a more insecure product. And uh, since IECS systems are into the critical infrastructure, uh, facilities, it might have an impact on the safety as well. So all countries have uh, certain um, regimes for uh, trade controls review. And uh, here I'll be just focusing on US. Um, so in the US, uh, it's mainly dealt with uh, ITAR and EAR. Um, so here we are not making a recommendation of how strong the cryptography has to be in a product, but what we are saying is if you're using anything, uh, if you're using a key length greater than anything mentioned over here, then it probably has to go through a trade control review. So it's 64 bit for uh, system, uh, symmetric algorithms, 768 for asymmetric, and 128 bits for elliptic curve algorithms. Uh, and also not to mention that in the US, uh, they have another um, I think what is known as the de minimis, which is, so if there is a minimum of, say, 10% content, um, US content in your product, you still need to go through the trade controls review. So um, was in our arrangement, uh, I won't be talking about that, because um, uh, earlier today we had another session from Katie, who is the expert um, on was in our arrangement, and she's also one of the advisors to the US government. Um, on was in our arrangement. Um, so what I'll be talking about is um, so the way it is organized in the US and why it's important. Um, so in the US, uh, it is handled mainly by ITAR. Uh, DOD oversees that. And uh, for civilian uh, purposes, uh, we use EAR, uh, which is overseen by the Department of Commerce via BIS. And what we want, or if, if it's a global product, containing encryption, what we typically want is we need to shoot for a mass market license, which is EAR99. Um, um, and, and ECCN is just a, a US term. So this is um, how complex it can get, and this is just for the US. Um, I won't be going through that, but this is just to show us to this is really a complex topic. Um, so having said that, what is the set of recommendations uh, that I want to give to all these SMEs? Um, there are three recommendations. So the first one is uh, to evaluate the product or the offer to ensure it is properly classified. So we have to understand as to what is the product capable of and what is in the product. So it's very important that we understand these things properly before answering the questions or completing the forms for trade controls. Determine where the product will be developed. 
source and manufactured. Uh, so it's very important that we understand this because um, I'll give you a, an example. So there was a product which was designed in France, manufactured in Germany with components from Romania and Indonesia. So um, three months um, before the sell date, um, somebody in the French team realized that probably we need to go through trade controls. And they went to ANSSI, ANSI and uh, SDBU, uh, who are responsible for issuing the licenses for France. And what the license that they issued was, uh, you can sell this product to EU plus seven other countries. Well, that was a bummer because uh, they expected the majority of the revenues outside the Europe, European Union. So what they did is they reached out to the team in the US, and the team in the US then went to um, the Department of Commerce, BIS, and the BIS said it looks pretty straightforward. It has to be a mass market product. So when we conveyed the message to the French team, they were excited. So they said that, so problem has been solved. We'll ship all the products to US, and then you can ship it all around the world. Well, it doesn't work that way because it depends on the country of origin. So we have to go by the rules of the country of origin. So we had to give them the letter that Department of Commerce issued, and then they went back to um, ANSSI, and so finally they got a mass market from uh, the French authorities. So by doing all this, we spent close to around eight to nine months, and um, so we were way past the sell date. So that is the reason it's very important. So the other point is to determine the geographic market the product is intended to serve. So another example, so in this product, which is actually a, a data aggregator, um, so the majority of the revenues from this product was supposed to be from China. And um, so everything was on time, on schedule, and uh, we went to the US Department of Commerce, got the EAR 99 mass market, and we were ready to ship the product to China. However, so we got a stop sign from China saying they were not willing to import the product. And the reason being that we were using HTTPS, and uh, so the Chinese government suspects that NSA has a backdoor in HTTPS. So the solution that they offered was either we strip out HTTPS, uh, ship them plain HTTP, or work with a Chinese company under the auspices of the Chinese government and integrate HTTPS. So, so these are the things, things that we uh, encounter. Um, and uh, this is not rocket science, um, especially our peers in the IT world have been doing a phenomenal job. Uh, so this is just like an example of Apple, uh, Microsoft has done a great job, Cisco, I mean, I can keep on uh, giving you names. But, uh, so this is what we are basically looking at. So what is the, and this is available on the website of their uh, respective companies. So what is the export control classification number? Uh, do we have a mass market or things like that? Uh, step two, so contact your trade controls or tax and customs or whatever team that you have or call within your organization because uh, it is better left to the experts. It's a very complex, complicated topic. Uh, if you don't have, uh, if you're a small company, you don't have tax uh, or trade controls team within your organization, you're better off consulting an expert. And this again is for France. Um, so just to show you the lead time, so it can take one, two, four, six, so close to eight months or whatever, right? So you have to make sure that we have these time uh, considered into the project timelines. And uh, step three, so confirm that the export regulation classification supports the offer strategy. So if an organization is following the Microsoft STL or its variant, what we recommend is to start early. So um, go for a preliminary classification during the require stage, and then if you add more countries, remove countries, do whatever, you can always refine it during the design stage. So in summary, what we are saying is trade controls in IIoT is an immature discipline. So mainly in the OT part, as I said, so mainly for ICS, and that too for small and medium-sized industries. Because what happens is whenever we are, like say for example, we are using a crypto library in one of our uh, product, uh, the crypto library would have a classification, and when we are using that in our product, the classification entirely changes. So we need to go for uh, reclassifying the product. Understand the product's 
components, subcomponents, including its origin. So um, it's very important, as I um, said earlier, that we understand not just the components, but even the subcomponents. Where is it coming from? Uh, do they have a classification already conducted on that component so that we can reuse that? Uh, start early, consider time and cost. So it's, uh, it's very important that you consider uh, the time and uh, the cost for your project planning and budgeting purposes. Do not expect all your key vendors or suppliers or contractors uh, to be compliant today. So you just need to be realistic. You need to work with them. Uh, it's a painful process, uh, we understand, but this has to be done. Uh, the, the reason that you're not seeing much news on this is because that it is not being enforced properly. So once government, I don't know when, but uh, uh, with the latest US government, you never know when they start enforcing things. So probably once they start expecting, you can see more traction on this topic. And lastly, uh, embed trade controls into your organ organization's supply chain process. So it is always better to have this embedded into a process so that you never miss this. Um, and this is what uh, we recommend. So that was a quick presentation. Thank you all. And life is on. <laughs>